We believe the purpose of music is to touch the human heart and to raise one's soul to a higher spiritual level. The German romantic artists, the poets, the philosophers, the novelists, the painters, the musicians also believed this. They believed all human beings were on a spiritual journey through life. They saw themselves as wanderers, and they viewed this primarily as a spiritual journeying, an inner quest. They felt their goal was to find their true selves, to heal their fragmented selves, and to find a spiritual home. They felt alienated from a world which was increasingly industrialized and urban, a society that seemed to them devoid of feeling. They were disillusioned by governments. They sought a paradise which they believed had once existed and then been lost. Many found what they needed in established religions. They sought what they needed in nature, and many elevated nature to the status of a religion. Nearly all of them believed music was the best vehicle to a better world. Like all humans, they sought to give and receive love and suffered greatly when it did not work out. Nearly every lead we will perform over these three concerts reflects the above ideas in some way and many in multiple ways. We put a few in for some comic relief, but most of them will fit into those ideas. It's interesting that our location tonight is named the Athenaeum. The literary magazine established by the Schlegel brothers in 1798 was called the Athenaeum, and it was of critical importance to the Romantic movement. I believe it's important to know what is behind the poetry philosophically, but leader can be made to seem too highbrow. The subjects are really not different from those we find in pop music. Love that works out, love that didn't work out, hopes, dreams, aspirations. And it should be remembered that leader's always been closely related to folk music from its inception. The poems came from the heart, the music came from the heart, and it's as personal and timeless as music can get. The pre-intermission portion of tonight's concert will be much, much longer than the post-intermission portion. Uh, the post-intermission portion will only last about 25 minutes or so. So please don't assume at the intermission that we're only halfway through. <laughs> we'll be uh, <laughs> well over two-thirds of the way through. But we felt uh, with the repertoire that we were covering, t covering tonight and what we wanted to uh, discuss, that it would be best work to do most of it in the first portion, where there's a lot of thought that will go on on your parts as well, and the second half, not half, the second one-third or less, is more a chance to sit back and enjoy the very, very relaxing songs of Schubert that we'll hear at that point. It would be a temptation to start a Lieder concert just with Schubert. Many people think that Schubert was the first composer of Lieder, but the lead had been significant in Germany for three-quarters of a century before Schubert wrote his first lead. Since there's not time to discuss the early history of the lead tonight, I urge you reading about that subject in the program notes. It is important to know where the later leader evolved from. Mozart's leader were not of great influence, since searching for meaningful poetry to set to music was not of great interest to the Viennese. When any lead was written, it was usually to use the poetry as a pretext to write beautiful music. Mozart wrote about 30 leader, and they were usually for his friends to enjoy. He even gave one friend permission to publish Als Luisa, that will be sung tonight, under the friend's name. Not surprisingly, Mozart's leader shared traits in common with whatever operas he was working on at that time. Als Luisa shares some of the drama of Don Giovanni, even the flames, and Das Fauchen was written at the same time as The Marriage of Figaro. Das Fauchen is Mozart's only setting of a Goethe poem. And by the way, except for Als Luisa, every other poem on our first half is by Goethe, the giant of German literature. So we're going to start with this Mozart group of Das Feilchen and Alice Luise, which must have the, the longest uh, full title of any lead I've ever encountered. You'll see it in your program. Uh, but Das Feilchen is a story of a little violet in the meadows who sees a young maiden coming and, and thinks to himself, oh, if only I were the most beautiful violet of all then that maiden would pick me up and would clasp me to her breast. Oh, just for a quarter of an hour, wouldn't that be heaven? And the girl comes along and takes no note of the violet and in fact, in fact crushes the violet under her foot. And so it kills the violet and as he's dying, he says, oh, so I die, so I die. It was by her lovely foot that I died. <laughs> And, and Alice Luisa is a, a, 
a young woman who is burning the letters of her of her unfaithful lover. It's interesting. Mozart added the last little uh, line to Das Valkyrie also. It's not in the Goethe poem, but he chose to add it at the end. Of it. <laughs> Beethoven has never been given enough credit for his leader. He gave the form a depth and an intensity. With the lead so popular, especially in North Germany, it's not surprising he wrote Lieder even as a teenager in Bonn. By the end of his life, he'd written 90 plus harmonized 130 folk songs. 
He also wrote the first important cycle of leader, Andifernet Galipta, to the distant beloved. A large number of his leader deal with unrequited love, which reflects his own life experience. It's long been my belief that far too much attention has been given to the image of Beethoven as angry and tempestuous, and not enough focus on the tenderness and love that filled this highly sensitive human being's heart. Goethe's poem, Vona der Wehmut, Delight in Melancholy, expresses the thought that life is made harder if one suppresses his or her tears, that it's better to release them and let them flow. You can hear the representation of sobs in the voice and tears in the piano. Flowly, the Song of a Flea, is an example of Beethoven's humorous leader, of which there are a considerable number. In Goethe's Faust, part one, Mephistopheles takes Faust to Auerbach's Keller, a tavern which has existed in Leipzig since 1438. This is actually to tempt Faust to enjoy the student drinking scene. Mephistopheles sings a song about a king who owned a flea and lavished abundant riches on it, even making it a minister of the government. Other members of the court refused to stop the flea despite being bitten. The song furnished comic relief in the play, but actually it was a political satire on the aristocracy's subservience to rulers. The notes at the end of the lead are not wrong notes, they're the fleas.
Goethe's novel Wilhelm Meister's Apprenticeship was one of the most influential literary works ever written. In fact, Schlegel equated it in importance to the French Revolution in terms of significant events occurring late in the 18th century. It is the classic Bildungsroman, which was a novel dealing with coming of age and the formation of character. An example of such a work in English literature would be David Copperfield. Our concern tonight is not with Wilhelm's growth or Goethe's ideas on literature, philosophy, or politics but rather a secondary character, Mignon. She is about 12 to 13 years old and was abducted by a troop of acrobats and entertainers and taken north. She's a rather pitiful waif with an ethereal, unearthly mystery. She is confused and has vague memories of her past. She does have an ability to sing. Goethe wrote four songs for her to sing in his novel. Actual melodies and accompaniments written by Goethe's friend Reichardt appeared in the original 1795 edition. All of her songs involve longing, and Goethe's text for her four songs have been set literally hundreds of times by composers of many nationalities. Tchaikovsky's None But the Lonely Heart is the most famous. In Kent's Du Das Lant, which is what we'll be performing tonight, the lonely homesick Mignon reveals in the first verse that her home was undoubtedly Italy with its blue skies, gentle breezes, its fruit, its beautiful vegetation. In the second verse, she describes her childhood house, with statues which she perceives are asking her what people have done to her. In the third verse, she describes the dangerous journey she made through the cloudy mountain pass across the Alps with a dragon lurking in the caverns below and torrential waterfalls sending boulders crashing down. This was undoubtedly based on Goethe's own journey through the St. Gotthard Pass in Switzerland, where he said he could imagine dragons lurking in the cave below. After each verse, there is a, a refrain where Mignon pleads to go back to that land, back to her home. We'll look now at three of the more than 100 settings of this poem. Schubert did set it, but the result is disappointing compared to many of his songs. Even out of 625 songs, not all of them could be the masterpieces that many of them are. But we have works here that separate by 40 years, Beethoven, Schumann, and Wolf, which gives us a so-called classical composer, a so-called romantic composer, and a late romantic composer. Rather than just performing the three leader, we thought it'd be instructive to first point out some similarities and differences. This is the only time that we'll be doing this tonight, and we hope some of the concepts can then be applied to your listening to subsequent leader. In terms of character, Beethoven effectively conveys a 12 to 13 year old child. Schumann actually said that he viewed Mignon as leaving childhood and being on the threshold of adulthood. Both settings seems very appropriate for a mature adult woman. All three settings are basically strophic, which means it's the same music for each verse. Beethoven thickens the texture and provides more activity in the third verse. Schumann makes the second and third verses the same, but asks the performers to perform them with increasing expression. Wolf modifies the third verse, but unleashes a torrent of sound as if it was a Wagner opera. The harmonic language of each composer evidences the increase in chromaticism during the 19th century, Schumann employing far more than Beethoven, and Wolf going wild with chromaticism, almost stretching tonality to its limits in places. The evolution of the piano writing is significant. Beethoven provides it a homophonic texture, with the upper line doubling the voice, which was the normal practice in his day. Schumann provides colorful harmonies and writes some lines independent of the voice. Wolf treats the piano as if it's an orchestra with multiple lines totally independent of the voice. Beethoven does not provide the piano with a prelude or postlude. Schumann writes a mournful, melancholy prelude which conveys Mignon's anguished mindset. 
He achieves this with much chromaticism and tortured leaps and a thick texture with multiple lines and sets it in a minor key. He provides a brief postlude. Wolf writes a prelude in a major key, which seems to paint a beautiful picture of the Italy that Mignon misses, and also provides a lengthy postlude. Comparing the vocal lines, Beethoven and Schumann keep to a narrow range while Wolf's is quite wide. Beethoven writes very tunefully with clear-cut phrases and a simple rhythm. Schumann's vocal line is more complex and the phrase is more irregular and unpredictable. This is typical of his later and less popular style, which we'll discuss more on Sunday when we cover Schumann in depth. Wolf's vocal lines go far beyond Schumann's with their employment of a very flexible speech-like line loaded with syncopations and unexpected leaps. We'll discuss both much more on Tuesday night. He's a very, very major person with the lead and far too little known. Comparing the handling of the refrain that has the key word dahin, meaning there, a Beethoven switches to a major faster tempo at that point. Schumann gradually intensifies to it, and Wolf uh, provides a huge outburst there. Beethoven expects the performers to be fairly steady within each of the two sections of each verse. Schumann expects considerable flexibility of tempo, and Wolf's language is heavily dependent on much tempo fluctuation. I think you'll enjoy hearing these side by side.
The original Danish legend concerned the elf king's daughter, who ensnared knights. Goethe's ballad made the Earl King the focus and made him into a force of death, preying on children. In this poem, there are four characters, the narrator, the Earl King, the child who believes he sees and hears the Earl King, and the father who assures the child he is not seeing or hearing the Earl King. <laughs> Goethe always has a deeper meaning in his writing, and one possible interpretation has been advanced, which suggests that the father represents rationalism and reason, and the child the power of the imagination and the emotions. There are over a hundred settings of Earl Koenig. Beethoven even started to write one, but never got far with it. Goethe's ideal composers of Lieder were Reichardt, who wrote 1500 Lieder, and Selter. Goethe felt their writing did not distract, distract from his words. He didn't approve of Beethoven's settings and returned unopened packages sent on two occasions of Schubert's settings of Goethe's poetry. Reichardt and Selter's names are known to some professional musicians, but few people anywhere today have ever heard any of their music. It's very difficult even to locate. We wanted to give you the opportunity to actually hear an example of each. Reichardt's Earl Koenig is in a minor key and has energy but little variety. Selter sets his Earl Koenig in a major key, for the most part, and at a slowish tempo. Schubert wrote his Earl Koenig in a few hours, at age 18, without a piano even being present. He then gathered up a few friends, they went to where there was a piano, and he played it and sang it to them. <laughs> it's a true story. <laughs> Hearing these three settings in succession helps one glimpse what Schubert did for the lead and why he's so important in leader history. If you've never heard the Schubert setting, you're in for a special experience.
The prevailing image of Schubert as a shy, chubby, humble, obscure fellow writing pretty music is wrong on all counts. <laughs> he was an energetic, forceful personality. What he believed, he felt deeply. With people whom he felt comfortable, he talked much and vehemently. He was not overweight. He did, though, continually reek of tobacco from his constant pipe smoking. He knew he was good, and he was gaining recognition at the time of his death. While there certainly is charm in his music, the common image overlooks the drama, the melancholy, the tragedy, the darkness, the despair, and the terror. At one point, Schubert said, do you know any jolly music? I don't. That, <laughs> that darkness mainly entered his music in 1824 when he learned he would die at a younger than normal age. Along with his friends, he felt alienated from the world around him. On the surface, Vienna seemed full of Gemütlichkeit, good spirit with its theaters, coffee houses, and widespread dancing after the Congress of Vienna had ended. This included the new dance form of the waltz. But beneath the surface, there was a widespread resignation and melancholy. The repressive police state made people, especially the intellectuals, seek escapes. They went inwards, to their homes, which in Schubert's case meant to his friends, to pantheism, and to the arts, both as a salvation for society and as a consolation to the individual. Liszt called Schubert, quote, the most poetic musician who has ever lived. 175 years later, I believe that statement is still true. One of Schubert's friends asked, quote, where do these songs come from? People have been echoing that question for two centuries. Schumann said Schubert's music, quote, seems to come from another world. One just can't explain why Schubert's music is so natural, so personal, so sublime, and yet so full of simplicity. Gerald Moore has referred to its radiance. The significant that song was Schubert's basic approach to music. Schubert had been a Vienna choir boy. This emphasis on song and melody was not only important for the lead, it was extremely important for the future of instrumental music. Schubert's lyrical qualities fertilized his own instrumental music and composers after him were motivated to make their instrumental music sing, as well as to include more color and emotional moods. Much music, therefore, became a song without words. I wonder more and more if Schubert was the most extraordinary of them all. If the following had died at age 31, here's what we would have. For J.S. Bach, the first Brandenburg concerto and some organ and harpsichord toccatas. From Haydn, basically nothing that we ever hear today. From Wagner, the Flying Dutchman. From Verdi, Ernani, and I Lombardi. From Brahms, the D minor piano concerto three piano sonatas and the first piano trio. From Debussy, some wonderful songs, but the only piano music would be the arabesque and the reverie. Schubert raised the lead to previously unknown heights. Every future leader composer is greatly indebted to him. He wrote over 600 in his short life, starting at age 14. Of the 90 poets he set, Goethe was the most frequently set with 70. It's interesting that Schubert chose to set poems of the young Goethe, which were full of pathos, rather than the classical poems of the older Goethe. Schubert's leaders span a huge variety of subjects. They're built primarily around the vocal melody, but the piano supports far, far more than in any music of his predecessors. It supplies a lot of the magic, including the frequent unexpected harmonies. So in the next set we'll hear, <coughs> We'll start with um, Andi Musik, which is a hymn to music, um, in honor of music. It says, in how many of my saddest hour have you comforted me, you holy art? I thank you for this. And then we'll move on to uh, Ständchen, or Serenade. And I think of this as a, this is definitely a gentleman's song. 
Uh, at our second concert, we'll talk more about gender in lead, in leader, and what, how, why we pick the songs we pick. How is it that I could sing a song from a male's perspective or vice versa, and does it always work? And sometimes, does it not work? So that will be on um, Sunday. Sunday. <laughs> That'll be on Sunday when we have Kirk joining us then. Um, so you'll have a male and a female singer on, on Sunday. But uh, it, it's from a male point of view, view, and he's beckoning his beloved um, to come and join him. And then we'll move on to uh, Di Forella, The Trout, which is a really fun song. Schubert did not set the last verse of the poem, but I'll just tell you about the, the part that's in the song. It's a, a man is observing a lovely trout swimming about in the brook, and the trout's so happy. And then he spots a fisherman coming with his rod. And he says, I don't know, as long as that brook is very clear, he's never going to catch that fish. And so the fisherman's waiting and waiting and waiting, waiting. And finally, he gets so impatient that he starts muddying the water with the rod, with, the, with his rod. And this infuriates the observer. And of course, then the fisherman catches the trout. And he, he, he calls it a stolen catch. Basically, he didn't deserve to get that catch because he tricked the fish. And the last verse of the poem that Schubert didn't set warns girls about being uh, seduced by rascals who muddy the waters. <laughs> so that's the moral of this thing. <laughs>
Speaking of gender, the last two pieces on our program are Gretchen Amspinrade and Dino Nonna, both, um, both from the point of view of the female character in the story. Uh, Gretchen is, um, well, what I love about this song is that you can hear, it's Gretchen at the spinning wheel. You can hear the perpetual motion of the spinning wheel in the piano part. And she's been abandoned by her lover and everywhere that she looks, the window, the door, she's searching for her everywhere. She's so restless in her soul. Do we know this feeling? Yes. <laughs> she can't sit still because she needs to find him and he's abandoned her. And you hear the restlessness and the movement of the spinning wheel. And then you and Anna uh, is uh, a, a young nun who is observing the storm outside of her house. And she compares it to the storm that once was inside of her. But then in her heavenly calling, she found her peace. And all throughout, you'll hear this, um, the tolling of the bell in the piano part. So there's two really wonderful things to listen for, the spinning wheel and the, the bell, that finally then beckons uh, the nun to, to be with Christ. Thank you. 